and welcome to a new episode of A Flatpack History of Sweden. This time it's episode 17, Viking Women Part 2. We are still in the middle of packing and moving from London to Sweden. Uh, so uh, we're recording this with quite a lot of, sort of suitcases and boxes around us. This will be the last episode we do together from our flat here in London. So, yeah, 17 recording sessions we've had together in this flat. Yeah, not too bad. Well, and a few news updates and the special episode on the dog tags too. So pretty much 20, I think. By yeah. Now. And this is where we sat when we did the great interview with the lovely people over at History Hack. Yeah, so we've had loads of stuff and done the intro for one of Jerry's Presidency's podcasts as well and recorded some promos for the Assassinations podcast. So saying goodbye to a lot of memories. Yeah, this will always be the flat where it all started. Yeah, and you're all actually flying tomorrow. So very much the last thing that you do in this flat, pretty much, yeah. is this podcast. Yeah, well, I do think it's a very fitting way of, uh, of leaving this. But speaking of the podcast, we should probably continue with this episode properly as we've got so much stuff to pack in. And we're going to continue our exploration of what the Viking Age life was like for women. Yeah. But first, shall we do the Swedish phrase of the week? Absolutely. Yeah, so this week's phrase is torta på torta. It literally translates to English as cake upon cake. But what it means, uh, there's actually a fancy word for what it means. It's called tautology. Yeah, or if you're talking in Swedish, because the word for cake is torta, it could be tautology. <laughs> I know you've you've been working on that uh, on that joke a long time. It basically means that you say the same thing twice but slightly differently. So in English, for example, we sometimes say chai tea. Well, chai actually means tea. So what you're saying is just tea tea. So the same with salsa sauce. Salsa means sauce. All of these uh, words are examples of tautology. So torta upon torta, cake upon cake. You've just said the same word twice, but in Swedish the phrase is used a little more generally than just referring to languages and things we say. We use it to mean more generally when something is surplus or unnecessarily too much. Thinking of an example, it's torta på torta to order cheese balls if we're already ordering mozzarella sticks. You can never have too much cheese in all its forms, so <laughs> I think that's not appropriate. Some might argue that cheese balls and mozzarella sticks are torta på torta, cake upon cake, it's the same thing twice, but obviously According to Chris, you can never have too much cheese. Anyway, onwards to today's topic, Viking women. Last week, we gave a bit of a brief introduction to what life would be like for women during this period. And today we're going to expand on that and talk about four topics that were especially important to women or where we see how women's lives would have been very different from men's in the Viking Age. That's not to say that there weren't other areas where the lives of women differed from the life of men or that are particularly interesting from a female point of view, but rather that these are just four areas that we thought were particularly interesting. So we'll be talking about the importance of marriage, slavery, women warriors and women on the battlefield, and also some clothes and jewellery. That is all very interesting indeed, but first, why don't you start us off with the question of how we get all this information? What sources are we looking at when we look at the lives of Viking women? Yeah, because as we'll see as we go, it's quite important to understand the different ways we look at this evidence and where it comes from and what that means for things like certainty and uh, things like that. So first, we have 
a great deal of sources and they, they're all very different, which is very exciting for us. A big starter for 10 for us is archaeology. Um, that comes up with the Birka woman or the Usseberg burials being two key examples of that. Second, we have the Norse sagas, those amazing contradictory but entertaining and sometimes elusive written texts from the Icelanders a lot later in history. There's so much to touch on those that we'll just have to mention them, but as we've mentioned them before, they're not entirely the most reliable, but they can be good for broad themes and ideas. And like a lot of the stuff that we've seen so far, some of the more interesting and different information actually comes from those international contexts and sources that the Vikings helped create when they met with these foreigners, either in Sweden or outside of Scandinavia, just like we had with Ansgar. Like all broad categories of historical records, these do come with varying degrees of reliability and accuracy and motive. We have the more or less reliable histories or annals written by priests, kind of masquerading as an early version of a professional historian who spent a lot of their time just writing down histories for their various reasons, and a lot of these in this period ended up recording Vikings and Viking raids. We can then graduate from them onto the fanciful accounts written up to four centuries later for political or religious, pretty much propaganda, which we can read somewhat differently. Giving some examples of these, on one end we have the great 9th century Frankish annals, like The Life of Ansgar by our friend Rimbert, and on the other hand we have this dramatic and pretty much romantic fabrication of an account of a Spanish embassy to a Viking court, which was written in the 12th or 13th century, which most historians think is pretty much made up. Of course, rather than just taking the words written down for granted, we need to know about how these people found out about the Vikings and why were they writing about them. Was it all first-hand? And if it was first-hand, how did they communicate with the Vikings? And what language did they speak when they were doing it? Yeah, I think this is a really important aspect, the translation. As, as we know from this podcast, from doing this, when you are translating a phrase, like we just did with torta po torta, you translate a phrase, a meaning or an idea, well, you have to ask yourself, how do you actually go about doing it? We tend to first translate our Swedish phrase directly for all of you, partly because most of them sound really funny, but then we try to tell you what it actually means, like with cake upon cake. At first glance, that doesn't really mean anything, especially if there's no cake involved in the situation when you say it. Every time you translate something, you're faced with decisions to make about what to emphasize, what feelings to convey, what shared knowledge and reference point we can assume that we all have. And if you're not careful, you can quite easily end up changing the meaning of what you've translated to quite a significant degree. So you need to delve deeper to find out what it means. And with all of these sources, like Ansgar meeting the Vikings, how did they find out about these Viking traditions and cultures? Because we know they didn't share a language. The famous Ibn Fadlan stories of the Rus are fascinating and give us a really detailed description of some of the more cultural aspects of Rus life, but as he was from the Caliphate and travelling through the lands where he saw these things, he must have been dependent on what he found out through his interpreter or through yeah, whoever translated for him. Exactly. And was that interpreter Rus? Was he an original Swede or Scandinavian? Or was he an Arabic kind of guy like himself? Or maybe some sort of middleman or middlewoman who's translating it between two different people? Did that interpreter speak Arabic fluently, or did the interpreter and Ibn Fadlan have to use a middle language like Greek that they both didn't completely get all the nuances of? So there can be so many of these different issues that appear up just in translating one little phrase like torta po torta. And when you're trying to translate really complex cultural habits and traditions, you can only imagine how complicated that gets to getting the exact meaning across on paper. And of course, Arabic has changed a lot in the last thousand years as well. So all of these different things are just leads us to be 
ever so slightly skeptical of just what the things say, even if it does seem to be giving a really accurate and specific account of what was happening. Heading back to the women in our story, unfortunately, the vast majority of the sources never really tell us the nationality of Viking women. So uh, like we touched on last time, there are usually many questions around if these women are locals to whichever area we are talking about, or are they slaves and wives that the Vikings sort of met or picked up en route, or perhaps they might be originally from Scandinavia traveling from Sweden, for example. We will never really know. Some specific examples may help us to understand who they are in each instance, but usually there is information lacking when it comes to women in particular. But that's not going to stop us from trying. So we should probably move on to our very first topic. For sure. Which is going to be marriage and betrothals. Yeah. So this is quite important because it's naturally how a lot of people back then lived their lives by being married to other people. Probably much more common than it is today with lots of people never getting married for whatever reason in the modern day. But we know that marriage was quite a different affair for women and indeed for men back in the Viking Age compared to what's happening and how people approach it today. The same goes for the actual process of getting betrothed and who had the agency in such decisions to begin with. Indeed, again, we're back at this issue of looking at the past through our own present understanding and feelings and values that we have about certain things. And we've talked about that before. One way that when we look back at the Viking Age, we might at first glance think Viking women had less independence and less agency is because of marriage and the fact that they were then just seen as the wife of Harald or the wife of Sven or the wife of whatever Viking, because that's how they tend to be mentioned in sources. So they're mentioned as the wife of rather than a person in their own right, which when we look at it, we might see as different to, you know, I certainly wouldn't like to be referred to as just the partner of Chris. I'd like to be Elsa in my own right, but I can't use that way of thinking when I look at the Vikings because it was very different, the whole idea of partnership and marriage. So if you are not going to get married, you would probably be a servant or maybe if you're lucky, you're living with a brother if you're a woman in the Viking age. But at least in the sagas, everyone gets married if you are not a servant. In reality, marriage would mean control over your own household. So you can spend money without asking your husband. You can inherit and have a say in things, including having legal rights you wouldn't otherwise have. Politics of the family would also be a thing as you, as a married woman, would be related to powerful local figures. Yeah, if you're lucky enough to be married to someone who is powerful locally, you yeah. might just be married to some random farmer somewhere. But women could be used by these local powerful men and rulers, and even up to people like kings, as a pawn in political manoeuvrings, as this was really much the age of marriage alliances and trying to secure allies in both war and politics through marriages. One big example we'll look at next time is the role that a particular Swedish princess had in securing peace between Sweden and Norway. Um, so that's very much a little bit of a trailer, but that's definitely a good example that we can talk about next time. Yeah. The betrothals themselves were extremely important, as was asking for marriage from a fellow political leader. Women also might have had some agency in that decision-making process, as we'll see next time with the example of the Swedish princess. 
One shorter example we can talk about today is that at some point during the late 800s, a king called Harold Fairhair ruled over a few scattered territories in southern Norway, and he asked Gida, the daughter of a king of Hordaland in western Norway, to marry him. But she refused to marry Harold because he wasn't a big enough, strong enough man and a king, and told him to come back when he was king of all Norway. Harold then vowed to not comb or cut his hair until he was the sole king of Norway, which is how he gets his name from, and ten years later he does this and they end up getting married, but she had the agency and the power to say, nope, not today, thanks, which is quite interesting. That is really interesting, really cool. And Now, this is, of course, like a pretty fantastical account, uh, as it was noted down in the Heimskringla, one of the sagas. But it's still interesting to see that Gida said no, and said no because Harald wasn't powerful enough to deserve her. And she's not just saying no to a, a local farmer because he's not powerful. He's already a local king with, you know, power and politics and money and prestige that all comes with it, but she's able to say no. Yeah, and just the fact that she says no in and of itself shows that she has that agency, that capacity to say no and not just being forced or sort of coerced into doing whatever is asked of her. Indeed, but unfortunately the average Viking woman didn't have that kind of opportunity and there's also this image of these shield maidens before they get married sailing around and acting like men and going on all these campaigns and conquests and things and that very much is a fantasy image really and in reality young women would have more or less stayed around in the local area waiting for a man in their family to tell them who to marry and they had no choice about it and that would form the little local alliances in the, the village or the town where they were living and it would pretty much act like a bit of a contract with the more powerful men in the family deciding for the daughter or the sister who, who they would marry. Yeah, and marriage at the time was so much more than an affair between two people. It involved whole families and if it was a woman with a lot of influence in society or someone from a powerful family, like a princess, a marriage was a political affair as much as anything else. So yeah, for more reasons than just a patriarchal idea of, you know, marry who dad tells you to marry, even though that was probably the case as well, women had to marry who they were told to in order to keep the cogs in a much larger political and economical societal system going. Yeah, so we, we can see how the, the betrothal process does have many ways of heading off, depending on who you are and what happens, but it is very much this power play, even in a very small sense for local people. But once those decisions were made, women also were relatively lucky in some ways that they had many different roles within their marriages to play, and this is a lot of stuff that we've seen a lot of the recent scholarship look into. One of them involves the image that everybody has of the Vikings, which is war and fighting and travelling abroad to do that. And these forays overseas and desperate attempts to defeat the Scandinavian invaders really has this string of women attached to it and they're involved in the narrative. Yeah, we see how these women get involved, sometimes badly and sometimes successfully, in both politics and war, uh, for example in a lot of the Viking campaigns in England. In 892, a Viking called Hestin raided up the Thames. Uh, he made a fort in Essex, but whilst he was fighting elsewhere, the English attacked that fort and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a contemporary account, says that they, quote, captured all that was within, both goods and women and also children, and brought all to London, and Hestin's wife and two sons were brought to the English king. So that's pretty much it. That's all that the women are mentioned in this story. 
So it doesn't really give us much, but we do know that Heston was the leader of this group of Vikings who'd been raiding the continent for many years before. So Judith Jesh is one of the historians who says that we can assume that his wife and children were there with him too on this overall journey and that these were the people who were taken by the English. When you look at the actual original text, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle uses the word with W-I-F, wife without the E, to talk about Heston's female companion, which, confusingly, this can mean both wife and woman, depending on the context in the original English. But as we can see that the English soldiers felt it was worth their while to take this woman to the English king along with the Viking leader's sons, we can presume that this is almost definitely the wife. At the very least, she must have had some sort of high status and probably not just be a slave girl that could easily be replaced by Heston because they're taken right to the English king as the reward or the bounty. And we can see that this meant a great deal to the Vikings because they learned from this mistake and next time they attacked they made sure that they had placed their women in safety in East Anglia before they left the fortress. Of course, even if the woman mentioned in this account was just a slave, the Vikings presumably didn't want the Anglo-Saxons just taking their goods and slaves would count in that category, so would want to protect them as they were worth something, either emotionally, politically or economically. Despite all of this, as we said, various historians take these examples to mean that these women were of importance to the Vikings and were likely the wives of those involved, partly because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle chooses to mention them, whereas they might not have been bothered if they were just simply slaves. And we'll see shortly the examples of what these wives and women would have been doing on these Viking expeditions. Um, but first, we're going to look at how they were involved in politics on these raids, because there's lots of examples of them being used in negotiations, either before or after raids. There's a piece in the Annals of the Frankish Kings, another continental source from the time, which mentions how a Danish king called Harald got baptised with his wife. And our lovely continental ruler from a few episodes ago, Louis the Pious, and his wives, they were the sponsors of the Danish king and queen during the baptism. The baptism and the conversion of this Danish king was actually the work of our good friend Ansgar. This was his first mission in 826, the one that he completed before he went to Sweden. So I think we said he spent a lot of his time growing up, learning about the monasteries and doing lots of things in Denmark. And this was it. This was his first proper success. I love how Ansgar is coming back. Whenever you least expect it, Ansgar is back. Yes, and he's going to be back next week as well, I promise. Um, but... The Annals of Bertin, another source mentioned back in Ansgar's episode, also mentions that another Viking leader called Wayland was baptised in 862 with his wife and children after losing in a battle to Charles the Bald, the son of Louis. We know that baptism was a big political tool used by European leaders to try and pacify Vikings after defeating them in battle. And this example shows you that the women were also important enough to be included in this ceremony, which was seen in some way as an international peace treaty. Uh, this is evidence that the women could also be part of that political game and be an example to the rest of the Danes back home. This involvement of women in international relations links back to our episode back in the East where the Rus leader Igor was negotiating a treaty with the Byzantine Emperor in 944 and 945. If you remember, the primary chronicle listed among the 50 diplomats and traders who went to speak to the Byzantine people. They were listed as Isgout for the Princess Olga, Kanitsar for Predslava, and Sigbjörn for Svanhild, wife of Olaf. So, at least in the East, these women were important enough in domestic politics and culture to be represented in this peace envoy to the Rus's big 
military and political rivals, and they wouldn't have just been included for fun, as any frivolous or unnecessary envoys arriving in Constantinople probably would have run the risk of annoying the Byzantines even further. So it shows you that they were there on merit. Yeah, and this is all very exciting and something to think about, that this just because they are described as the wife of someone doesn't mean that these women did not have agency in and of themselves. It is also very interesting as it shows you that it wasn't just the wife of Igor who was represented on the trip, but at least two other women as well. So it wasn't just a one-off, you know, involving the wife of one leader, but also the wives of other leading men in that area. When we look at marriage from the other side of the raiding coin and peace treaties, sometimes the Viking leaders of the raids were given wives as part of the peace treaty. So we can see in 882, Charles the Fat, uh, they have these all these relatives of Louis the Pious. He really got the best one, the, yeah. the Pious, and he's got fat and bald after him. But so... <laughs> I do not want to go drown in history as Elsa the Chubby. No. That <laughs> that'd, that'd be... Oh, yeah, oh you Charles have to, the Fat. Have to stay around long enough to edit your own Wikipedia article. Yeah. <laughs> Elsa so, the Great. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, in 882, Charles the Fat gave his cousin's daughter to the Viking king Godfred in order to get him to leave his kingdom. And leave he did, so this was presumably a decent ransom or an incentive to get them to leave. All of those examples just show you that these prominent women were influential in politics and worth something to their husbands and fathers and to the wider political context. But unfortunately, there were other women on the opposite end of the spectrum who were not as fortunate and not cared about as much when compared to these influential, high-status women. Now, we haven't talked a huge amount yet about slavery in the Viking Age, but we have touched upon it, and this was absolutely something that affected women as well. Definitely, but I think that before we talk about female slavery during the Viking period, there is a quote from Dr. Friedrich's daughter's book, Valkyrie, that we mentioned last time, that I'd quite like to read out. It's uh, quite long, but it gives a really nice context to the many different factors of life that affected women and that are perhaps most clearly seen when you talk about slave women. So I quote, Gender is a fundamental category that has structured human society throughout history, but it is much more complex than simple male-female binary. One of the factors that complicate gender identity, especially for women, is age. Women were, and are, perceived differently depending on whether they are unmarried or married, fertile or not, and becoming a widow could give women a newfound freedom and independence, but also leave them unprotected. As both literary sources and burials show, Old women were sometimes seen as dignified and worthy of respect, or witch-like. The Norse had sophisticated laws that provided married and widowed women with substantial scope and security, and the protections afforded to children suggest that they were seen as valuable members of society. On the other hand, adolescent girls seem to have had little ability to make their own decisions and they were often married off as suited the family. Social status is another factor that intersects with gender and different social groups probably had different dominant gender models. However, the lives of upper-class women would have been very different from those of peasants and servants, let alone slaves, who probably had dreadful lives, and elite women might not have shown much solidarity with their sisters across the class divide. Quote finished. But it is a very good quote, uh, because like it suggests, there might be an even greater difference between the life of a Viking queen and a Viking slave woman than there would be between a Viking man and a Viking woman of the same class. So 
at least the fact that you were both women doesn't necessarily mean that you were united in some sort of common goal or sisterhood as there would have been many other aspects of your life that separated you from each other. Yeah, much like today, I suppose. There are certain aspects that are common experiences for all women, or at least the vast majority, but the aspects that make our life experiences different are also huge. But back to women slaves in the Viking period, they were very much at the bottom rung of the societal ladder. Servitude seemed to have been very much a fact of life during the Viking time. It was completely normal that you had servants, both free and enslaved. This is reflected in how even Viking gods had servants, indicating that this structure was very much just how the Vikings perceived the world. And this was reflected in a rather clear division of labour, especially on farms. Even within what might have been considered the women's work, there was a difference between what the farm owner's wife did, what the children did, and then what the servants or slaves did. It seems female servants, both free and in particular those who were enslaved, did some truly back-breaking work. The Eddic poem Rigspua depicts a female slave working outdoors in bare feet getting burned by the sun. And in another Eddic poem, The Song of Grotti, girls complain about working barefoot in the cold, wet mud. But it wasn't just the work that was hard. The living arrangements for enslaved women seem to have been pretty gruesome too. There are suggestions that some slaves slept in the same space as the animals, just like back in the Bronze Age, I think it was, where they moved the cows in to keep them away from the colder winters. They're, they're doing it in the Viking Age too, but not because of necessity, but because of the rank in society that some people had. The living arrangements in the Viking period in general seem to have varied and changed a whole lot, depending on which geographical area you're in and what work you were doing. Then there are, of course, the issue of enforced sexual relations and rape of women slaves. Whilst there were laws against raping and impregnating free women in the Viking Age, slave women seem to have been pretty fair game, for the lack of a better word. In fact, sex with and rape of low-born girls is treated casually in many sagas, where the hegemonic point of view is often aristocratic and male, according to Dr. Friedrich's daughter's book. Yeah, it really does paint a pretty gruesome picture indeed of the lives of these Viking women. So it's not something I would have pretty much liked to either experience or even witness or be a part of really. It's pretty no, horrific. Definitely. And it's all just that this is evidence of the difference in status that women in the Viking period had. There were some approaching what could even be called as rulers, with some of the queens having more independence than others. Especially when you go out to the east, we're going to look at next week, we're going back to Olga's story, yeah. when she was a, a regent for over a decade. So you get examples of that, or examples of women in the Usseborg burial mound, which is a really famous burial ground with two women in it, but they seem to be one as a ruler with all the grave goods, with another woman buried as some sort of sacrifice. And the amount of grave goods associated with this find is amazing, and the very lavish burial has led some archaeologists to believe that the main woman must have been some sort of woman of very high esteem in the local community to be treated this way in death. Yeah, I, the, the class divide, if you want to call it that, in Viking society seems to have been pretty extreme if you go from that, what Chris, what you just described, uh, for queens and high status women to then, yeah, rape and uh, working barefoot and sleeping with the animals for slave women. But changing the tone slightly and making sure that we're not stuck in a narrative that describes Viking women as victims, uh, we're going to change the topic slightly and talk about a very different group of women, namely women warriors and those living in and around the battlefield. Yeah, because there really is this fascination of 
the idea of women warriors throughout the Viking Age, but it's not as simple as it might seem. No, so far in our episodes, we've seen a lot of fighting and raiding and warfare when it comes to the Vikings, and that is obviously something that they are very famous for. Now, at first glance, these Viking raids and taking over foreign lands might seem like it was a male-only activity, but more recent academic studies and archaeological excavations have proven that that's not really the case at all. No, and there's also a lot of written evidence for the appearance of Viking women in these actions. And these literal Viking women took many roles both in and around the battlefield. We can see a bit of this by looking at another fun source, which is written by a guy called Abbo of Saint Germain, who was a monk living in Paris. And he wrote a poem called The Bella Paritakea Urbis, a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But he writes this poem about a Viking attack on Paris in 885, when the Vikings had besieged his city, and there was a lot of fighting over a long period of time as to who would control the city. Yeah, it is in this siege that we see how crucial some of of the women were to the success of the ongoing siege. Uh, in one lull in the fighting, some mortally wounded Vikings returned to their ships where their women were waiting, hoping to be treated for their wounds, but finally die. Abbo writes that the women started tearing their hair and weeping, but then turned to their Viking husbands who had brought the wounded back and started to urge them back to the battle, saying that they were trying to flee the furnace of battle and they called them the sons of the devil. So they're not very happy that these Vikings have returned from the battle and aren't injured. Not at all. If that wasn't bad enough, they also accused the Viking warriors of cowardice, saying that they only came back to the boats to get a second helping of the bread, wild boar and wine that the women were preparing for the rest of the soldiers. After hearing this and having a lot of shouting at them, their men promptly run back to the battle, heeding the wise words of these uh, Viking women down by the boats. Yeah, telling them not to give up and just come back and munch on wild boars, but get back there and fight! Yeah, and there's another example of this work done by women in helping to provide food for the Viking raiders when he describes how the women were making bread for the soldiers, but they had to go and scavenge and find the ingredients for it. And there's a story about how they start making bread with holy water by accident and it all starts going a bit wrong um, but that's just another example of how they had the responsibility for feeding these giant armies and invasion forces. Yeah it shows that the Viking wives and women in general were expected to do the cooking during battles which is hugely important. I mean, you, you don't fight any battles on an empty stomach the women also had to try and make some of it themselves on the fly by just finding ingredients like holy water <laughs> mistakenly. So they were very much in charge of that logistical aspect of fighting battles. Uh, but apart from long sieges, which would have needed this sort of long-term infrastructure and logistical support, did women travel with the Viking expeditions for shorter battles or wars? Well, a lot of historians think that they probably wouldn't have gone on the very first raids of the season, so when it's now safe enough to travel across places like the North Sea, they might not have gone on the very first raid where they're just going for a short trip to nick some treasure and coming back. But once we progress through the Viking period especially, we start seeing Viking armies beginning to settle and overwinter in places like England, where they're creating huge bases of operations. And it's at this time where we can see that some women and children go too, and stay in these places of relative security, just like we mentioned with the leader Heston and his wife being captured in Essex. In general, it can be seen through huge burial sites such as that of the Viking Great Army in a place called Repton in England, that a lot of women were present as helpers, hangers-on, supporters, not to mention all this providing in terms of food and supplies that would have been needed for such a huge army like this. In addition to just the food, these women would have been taking part in the huge labour tasks of making and repairing clothes, textiles and equipment, all of that cooking, plus being nurses of some kind. 
The Icelandic sagas mentions this on a number of occasions. If any of the ships had been damaged in the fighting, the women's expertise as sailmakers would have definitely come in handy. And we know that this is one of the most important roles that women had back in Scandinavia, as it's mentioned quite a few times in these sagas. I remember when the... Uh, the Viking killed the other Viking because he was crying about his sail. Do you remember that one? Yeah, yeah. for sure. So we can see how the sails are obviously super important. Yeah. And it was the women who had to look after them and make them in the first place. So this is all adding to stuff like the poem of Abbo, which shows that they had at least some effect on the morale and the fighting spirit of the men as well, with their encouraging and screaming and tearing their hairs out at the supposed cowardice of warriors. Yeah, but what about doing any actual fighting? This question of whether or not there were actual sword and axe wielding, fighting on the battlefield, warrior women in the Viking Age has been debated among historians and researchers for a long time, and it still is. Absolutely, and it's something that is still a very hot topic of debate, and Dr. Lesek Gardella from the National Museum of Denmark was actually on the brilliant History of Vikings podcast uh, where he discussed this and concluded that some women might have occasionally took part in ad hoc military activities, but it certainly wasn't common or the rule or expectation. Yeah, so that's a statement very much far from certainty, but still being open to the possibility, which, judging from what I've been reading on the subject, uh, I'm quite inclined to agree with, and there seems to be a fair amount of researchers that argue that point. Maybe, but not very likely, and if so, only very occasionally. And we don't have much clear, tangible archaeological evidence for it either. Yeah, because whilst there are archaeological examples of how weapons have been found in graves of young Viking women, we still don't know exactly what that means. There are about 20 to 30 graves across Scandinavia where women have been buried with weapons, uh, there are even some graves, like one of a young woman in Norway, where there are quite a lot of weapons. There's sword, axe, shield, there's the carcass of a horse. Uh, essentially, this girl was buried with everything that a warrior needs. Yeah, but even with these graves in mind, like also said, we still don't really know what that means. It could mean that just these were warriors and they were buried with all their warrior stuff, but it could also mean that they were politically powerful or came from politically powerful families, and all of these weapons could have been symbols of power rather than actual tools of fighting like they were potentially made for. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that makes sense. So, like... I have a favourite dress, and it's got flamingos on it. Now, say that I die and I get buried in that dress because it's my favourite dress. Then, a thousand years from now, they dig up my grave and use it to study what life was like in the 2020s. Now, they might ask themselves what the flamingos on my dress mean. Was I a keeper of flamingos? Did the flamingos mean something in the religion that I practice? Did I have a diet that was based largely on flamingos? But then actually, the flamingos on my dress mean nothing, really, other than the fact that I liked that dress and therefore I was buried in it. So it's very difficult to draw any conclusions. It is a nice dress, though. But especially when you look at these symbols of power, so... The job that I am just finishing in a week's time or so, I work for the grand titled Lord Mayor of Westminster, which is a apolitical figure in local politics in London. But he has a sword and he has a mace. He has three maces, actually. And he gets involved in processions at Westminster Abbey where his sword is carried in front of him and the mace is carried in front of him. These are symbols of power. The sword is never taken out of its scabbard and the Lord Mayor certainly doesn't run <laughs> around with the sword aloft stabbing people or proclaiming his rule over the local area. Not, it's not just... even when he doesn't think you do the job very well. He doesn't no. get the sword out. The sword has not been unsheathed in my presence. But it's very it's, good. Uh, this is just how political power is manifested and shown through society and has been done for forever, really. The images of these weapons and their use of them, as we can see, they're still involved in local politics in London today. And 
it's it's just a symbol of authority. So I can entirely see how if a king's daughter died young, it would have been buried with the king's favourite sword or something to symbolise their power. So when they go to Valhalla and are in the afterlife, they've got their symbol of power for them. It doesn't mean that she was stabby-stabby on the battlefield and killing all of her enemies. Yeah, indeed. Another reason why it's perhaps not likely that there were many fighting female Vikings is all those things that we mentioned in the last episode about high child mortality rates and Viking women spending a large part of their adult lives being pregnant, breastfeeding, and caring for small children, which are all things that limit your availability to take part in the battlefield. One potential female Viking warrior that's received a lot of attention recently is the woman found in a grave in Birka that we talked about a lot in episode 12. For decades after the grave was excavated, it was assumed that this was the grave of a man, simply because the body was found with weapons and with tools that are gendered as male and tools of a warrior. It was only recently that a DNA test confirmed that the grave actually contained the remains of a woman. The grave is actually located close to the garrison at Birka, which further adds to the interpretation that it might have been the grave of a warrior. But one of the most important ways of looking at whether these people did any fighting or not is actually looking at the bones themselves. And unfortunately, the, the ones of the woman in Birka, they don't have any wounds and they're not dense and strong like they would be if this person was a warrior and was regularly using their muscles and building up their strength to be a warrior. So that certainly puts it in the category that this person wasn't a warrior. But overall, we're not saying there weren't any women Viking warriors. On the contrary, there's evidence to suggest that there were some, especially if you look at the sagas. We're just trying to highlight how difficult it is to interpret some of these things, especially the archaeological evidence that we have at the moment. So a lot of the indications for the positive identification of women warriors are in those literary sources that can be a bit sketchy. Yeah, in one of the sagas, the Haralda saga, there is a story of a woman who becomes a Viking, uh, in the sense of she goes off to fight, and asks her mother to give her things to be a Viking, quote, like a son. So this character then adopts a male name as well. I suppose, in a way, this opens up for the question of transgenderism as well. We're discussing this as if male or female Vikings were the only two options. Perhaps there was a way for someone who was biologically born female to go off and fight by presenting in a more male way. Now, this is a relatively unexplored territory and something that we don't have a huge amount of research on, nor source material for that matter, but it's an aspect worth mentioning. Yeah, absolutely, and it shows you how there could potentially be a space for anybody to identify and be who they wanted to be, regardless of their sort of biological birth, which is certainly something that is you've seen throughout history, examples of this happening, where it's not... People aren't just conforming into the norms of their society because they're being themselves. And this just adds to the very complex nature of what life was like for a woman because it's, there's such a broad scope of what that could actually mean. For sure. And one final aspect of the topic of women Viking warriors that we won't cover today, but it's worth mentioning just briefly, is how when we have sources talking about women fighting and women being in a sort of battle setting, they're often accounts with supernatural elements to them, like for example in the sagas. We're definitely planning on doing a section or an episode on religion and mythology during the Viking Age because this is the foundation for so much of the literary information that we have. So we'll leave that till then, but there is a lot of this stuff like also says about how a lot of the sources talk about women fighting in this mythological or fantasy setting and not too much talking about it in the real world. So that's something we'll come back to later. Yeah, something about women during the Viking Age that we do know quite a bit about is what they wore in terms of clothing and jewellery, and from that we can paint quite a nice picture of what they looked like. <laughs> 
Yeah, one reason that it's easier to know more about these things than abstract things like interpersonal relationships or gender self-identity is that these jewellery is preserved over time and is found in numerous archaeological digs all over Scandinavia and beyond. So we can actually look at this physical, tangible evidence. Yeah, and it might seem like a bit of a trite subject, but I think that what we wear and what we look like What's deemed nice and suitable to wear it tells us quite a lot about the world we're looking at. One thing that stands out when we look at what the Vikings wore is that not just women, but also men, were no strangers to extravagant clothing. No, Vikings seem to have been all about the bling, really. As Dr. Friedrich Stotter puts it in her book, and I quote, the graves the Vikings left behind show that they had no qualms about ostentation, and both men and women decorated themselves with anything shiny or colourful that they could get their hands on. Sounds nice. A bit like how I draw some of them in the episode pictures. Yeah. Uh, like to get a bit of colour in them. And we can see from this and other evidence that the women like to wear brooches on each side of the chest, just under the shoulders. And these were used to hold up the dresses and other clothing. The richer you were, the more extravagant these brooches and other jewellery would be as you use your power and your economic background to help you showcase this. Yeah. Women's clothes, and indeed all clothes, were most often made from wool, a material that the Vikings had relatively easy access to, thanks to all those Viking sheep. Uh, only the very rich could afford to wear linen, and later silk. Of course, what Viking women wore depended on where they lived, which modern-day country they lived in. The climate in North Norway is very different to southern Denmark. And especially even when you go to the east to places like ukraine and when they're visiting constantinople you're going to be wearing very different clothing depending on where you are but it also the dip where you are depends on what you could afford and which part of society you are coming from in general though viking women's clothes were non-restrictive and designed to allow them to be physically active and mobile to get involved in all of that sail making and cooking and running the farm and chasing after the children and all that kind of thing. And some of the clothes were also specifically designed to allow for breastfeeding to be done more easily and to accommodate pregnancy, which is really practical. Yeah, most Viking women seem to have worn a simple ankle length dress and a pinafore style apron to cover that. They probably also wore a varying amount of like underdresses and tunics in addition to the dress to stay warm depending on where they lived. Viking women often wore shawls to cover their hair, not necessarily for religious reasons, as we might associate that with today, but just because you're working very physically and outside a lot, so it's quite nice to cover your hair, especially when it takes so long to wash it and keep it clean to begin with. Yeah, and speaking of shawls, as we know, Sweden and Scandinavia gets quite cold, and so Viking women would have covered themselves in a lot of shawls and sort of coat-type garments to stay warm. And on their feet, they would have worn shoes and ankle boots made from leather, or a sort of weird thick sock made by needle binding. Needle binding, by the way, is a method of making very dense items from wool. It's actually an older method than both knitting and crochet, and seems to have been very much used in the Viking Age. Viking women also wore more colourful clothes than we have perhaps expected to be doing. They used various things found in nature to dye their clothes, and for some reason blue seemed to be all the rage in the time, at least for part of the Viking period. Yeah, if you look at burial outfits from Iceland in particular, this one blue colour that you get from making a dye from woad, which is a cabbage-type plant, that was super popular. Women's clothes also came in different patterns, diamond stripes played, herringbone shaped. Yeah, so it wasn't just one standard clothing that's mass produced and everybody wears it. There was personality involved. Definitely. Now, not all the women could afford lots of jewellery and cool blue clothes to make their mark on things. 
We talked about slaves earlier, and considering how costly it was to make clothes, it's quite likely that slave women just wore clothes that were just easily available from quite coarse material, and that they didn't really have much of it to begin with in the first place. They were probably not always given shoes, which is very harsh when you consider how cold it gets in parts of northern Scandinavia. And that's what also mentioned was in some of the sagas earlier about having to work in the cold mud with no shoes. Yeah, definitely. And the poor states of servants and slave women's clothing and general appearance is something that's often commented on by writers from the time. So it must have been seen as something that was rather noticeable. This stands in a bit of contrast to the accounts that suggest Vikings were quite careful with their grooming, especially their hair, which they seem to have taken particular good care of. Combs are something that's found in a lot of graves, even in graves of the relatively poor people, or the disabled or otherwise marginalised members of Viking society. So making sure that you could look after your hair seemed to have been quite a big concern for the Vikings, showing you that if these slave women didn't, that really meant they were at the bottom of the pile. This certainly goes against the popular image of the dirty, brutal, ogre-looking Viking. It seems that, in actual fact, they were all about dressing well and, you know, not necessarily going to the hairdresser, but combing their hair and making sure they looked good. Examples of how women would wear their hair can be seen on picture stones on the Swedish island of Gotland, and judging from these, women usually wore their hair in ponytails or in coils around the base of their head. We can look into more detail too once we go back to the account of Ibn Fadlan, which we actually touched on during one of our episodes in The Roos. I think we used a very shortened version of this quote, so let's read the full one for now. He says that, each woman wears on either breast a box of iron, silver, copper, or gold. The value of the box indicates the wealth of the husband. Each box has a ring from which depends a knife. The women wear neck rings of gold and silver, one for each 10,000 dirhams which her husband is worth. Some women have many. Their most prized ornaments are beads of green glass of the same make as ceramic objects one finds on their ships. They trade beads among themselves and they pay an exaggerated price for them, for they buy them for a dirham apiece. They string them as necklaces for their women. Oh, very cool. I mean, it sounds a little bit like this idea of how they dressed to indicate the wealth of their husband. It'd be a bit like if I walked around with your payslip stitched to my dress. Yeah, but then going back to the interpretation, he might be thinking that they do that deliberately, but it would be the same thing as if you walked around with an expensive Gucci bag. You're not doing that to show that you are wealthy, but by wearing it, it shows that you are. So it might be one of those things. He's saying that, you know, they're not actually doing it deliberately to show off how wealthy they are, but the fact that they have it shows you that they would have been wealthy. So yeah. again, it's the reasoning behind it is potentially lost. For sure. That should hopefully have given you a little bit of an overview on some of the main aspects of women's lives during the Viking Age and the role they played in how we look back at this period. Yeah, we've looked at Viking women in and around battlefields, how marriage might have been involved with politics and local power, and how Viking women would have been busy making sails and keeping the whole economy floating. Yeah, and we've looked at those Viking women unfortunate enough to be slaves, and what they wore, what you would have looked like if you were a Viking woman. Yeah, so we're going to continue on this next week with me and a to-be-determined special guest, we, we hope, anyway, to take the place of Orsa while she's in Sweden and I'm still in London. And we're going to bring you three different biographical stories of three women who lived in the Viking Age. One princess, one normal person convert to Christianity, and then finally get to Olga's story of her regency of the Rus in the mid-900s, which I'm very much looking forward to telling you all. It is very cool indeed. But before we go, uh, we've said thank you to the flat and the apartment that we live in. But we thanked a few people in the last episode, all the lovely people who've been listening. And I forgot, uh, we've had two 
very lovely listeners from California. I thanked Bill from California last week, but not Jim. So hello, Jim. Thank you for your lovely messages on Facebook about what the weather's been like in the Golden State recently. It's been very hot again today in London. Out of nowhere, it's gone up to sort of nearly 30 degrees. So yeah. we're lucky that uh, we're going to be moving to a slightly colder country where it's not as boiling when we're doing our podcasting. But um, hello to everybody, uh, Jim and Bill from California and all the others that we get from the golden state because california is very much at the top of the list of the uh, states that we get our most listeners from in america there's new york uh, colorado washington state up in the northwest and with california out in top so Lovely. thank you to all the americans we're still yep. looking we're still looking for north and south dakota come on dakotas yeah there's only about a million in each so it is like asking for estonia to find us a listener but north and south dakota you're on the list yeah right? And so are you, Estonia? Yeah. No, we've had lots. Well, a few, anyway. We're at least 20 downloads oh, from Estonia. Oh, so. I, I take everything I said away. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's... Thank you once again for yeah. listening. We're available on all those social media platforms like normal, on Twitter and Facebook, and also on our email address, flatpackhistorysweden at gmail.com where we'll probably be replying to you from Sweden. Yeah, and don't forget to leave a review. It helps us get noticed. So uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, uh, please write a little review on whatever platform you're listening from. But most helpfully on iTunes. Yes, but then it's uh, for the last time from me, goodbye from London. Goodbye, hey Hey Hey-do.